Hello and welcome to Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. On this month's edition of Other Voices, we are going to talk about a very local topic and a very serious topic, and that's the affordable housing crisis, not only in Silicon Valley, but up and down the peninsula and indeed around the Bay Area. We have skyrocketing rents, unjust evictions, and a very powerful uh, property owners uh, lobby talking to all the city councils in the area. We're going to take a look at this crisis, and it is indeed a crisis. Joining us in the studio to help us understand what's going on and how we might resolve this crisis, I'm really pleased to welcome, starting at the far end of the table, Daniel Saver. He's a housing attorney with Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto. Daniel, welcome to Other Voices. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And sitting right next to me is Diana Reddy. She's an activist with Redwood City Residents for rent, Rental... Renter protections. Renter protections. I knew I asked something off of there. <laughs> Redwood City residents for renter protections, and she's also active with uh, the San Francisco Organizing Project and Peninsula Interfaith Action. Diana, welcome to Other Voices. Thank you so much. And we hope, if all goes well, we will also be joined via Skype, and you'll be able to see her here, uh, Maria Marroquin with the Mountain View Tenants Coalition, and Maria is also Executive Director of the Mountain View Day Workers Center. Maria is over at Mountain View City Hall right now where there has been uh, a rally in favor of, of affordable housing and they have about 75 people lined up inside to talk to city council there um, who is, they're gonna make a, an initial consideration of a couple of proposals what to do about rents in Mountain View. We're going to talk about more on that later. Let's keep our fingers crossed that Maria can join us from there, but we don't know what the schedule over at City Hall is. Um, but uh, let's start there. Let's try to put some scope on the size of the problem. Last night um, at Palo Alto City Council, a whole bunch of people showed up. There were like uh, 10 people in their 20s who were all graduates of Gunn High School or Palo Alto High School. They're all living with their parents. They've gone off to college, come back, gotten good jobs here in the area. They can't afford to stay in their hometowns. Then employers got up and testified that they can't keep good workers in high-paying jobs because they still can't afford to buy a house uh, or, or to rent a decent place. So we're losing employees. We're, we're losing residents who don't make as much money, that, whose services are critical. Um, Try to put a handle on this. How big is is the housing? Let me start. Uh, is the housing crisis? Let's try to put some context on it, Diana. So one piece that I might say is that in one year there were 114,000 jobs that were created in Silicon Valley, and only 8,000 units of housing. So it's no wonder that there is huge pressure on housing. And in anywhere else in the country, the um, the poverty level might be about 10 percent, but in this area, particularly in Santa Clara County, it's 18 percent. And the, um, the number of people, multiple families living together, it's over 100 times what it is in other, in other parts of the country. So this is indeed a very serious uh, Two and three issue. families sharing one place. A so whole they can family afford. in a bedroom. I know one um, young man. Um, he and his mother were sleeping on their couch and renting their two bedrooms to other families so that they could pay their rent for their apartment. Wow. Yeah, so it's, um, it's really a very serious And thing. you mentioned 18% poverty rate for Santa Clara County. Um, I know you do a lot of work in San Mateo County. Yes. Do you have the same number absolutely, there? Absolutely, absolutely the same. Um, in any, pla any other place in the country, if someone makes $50,000, they are really able to have a very nice life. But here, it's you would have to pay, be paid forty-eight dollars an hour in order to afford a one-bedroom apartment at today's rents. The scope of this, from what you see, is as a housing attorney, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's pervasive, and I think the stories that Diane is telling and that you told at the beginning about what you heard at the Palo Alto Council meeting gets a little bit at the scope of the problem. I think for a long time there was this narrative that this is just a problem for low-income people. Right. That's really what it is. We're all doing fine, and it's just the poor folks who can't afford to live here. Uh, and that's just not true anymore. You know, it's really affecting uh, working-class families, middle-class families. I mean, the, I know in, I also work a lot more in San Mateo County, but there, you know, the, the median income for a family of four is, you know, over $100,000. 
Um, and even for a lot of those families, they certainly can't afford to buy a home no. in this area. That's completely out of reach. And so you're stuck renting, and that has placed, along with a lot of the other causes that y'all have mentioned, tremendous pressure on the rental housing market. Um, so I see this as a, a problem that's really affecting the entire economy, the entire population here in one way or another. It's either affecting you because you're renting or it's affecting you because you know, the folks around you are impacted or you know, the teachers at your kid's school are being impacted, et cetera. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. and it sounds like a recipe for a downward spiral, really. One problem feeding the other, feeding the first, and uh, it gets us on that. that. So what we're gonna talk about is, is how we get out of that. But um, I don't want to get too hung up on statistics, but sometimes you have to. Do you have a rough idea in this general area what percentage of the population are renters as opposed to homeowners? Each city is different. Yeah. Um, I'm more familiar with San Mateo County's yeah. cities, but Burlingame is 52%. Redwood City is almost 50%. Um, they were saying that it was 47% at the last, um, the last count, but I think it's more than that because we've added so many apartments um, re more re in recent years. When I was talking to Maria the other day, she mentioned that Mountain View is mm -hmm. 61%. There, yeah. yeah, Mountain View is somewhere around 60%. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, which is, to be honest, a little bit of an anomaly in this mm -hmm. area. There are some cities that have much higher uh, proportions of homeowners, but I think what you're seeing both here in Silicon Valley as well as really throughout the rest of the country is what some folks have called the rise of the renter nation. I mean, you've seen the percentage of the population that is renting increase essentially ever since the recession. Yeah. When a lot of folks lost their homes, those people had to do something for a home. Mm -hmm. And people who used to own are now renting. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I think, as Diana said, you're seeing a lot more folks renting now um, in these areas as well. And I think the numbers that she quoted will be rising in the next you know, three to five years. Roughly around half the people. We're, yes. So we're talking about half the, the population mm -hmm. in the area is, is at risk. I can see on my monitor that we are joined by Maria Marroquin uh, with the Mountain View Tenants Coalition. And Maria is also executive director of Mountain View Day Workers Center. Maria, let's see if the connection is working. Can you hear me? And we're not hearing you. Say something. Okay, How is can, everybody? We are uh, so excited in this town. Okay. <laughs> it's like you are having a lot of fun, guys. Okay. <laughs> well, it's great to have you with us. So how did it go at, uh, at City Council tonight? Well, uh, it's going pretty well. There's a lot of people. Um, unfortunately, a lot of kids that uh, are running kids around uh, just uh, <laughs> struggling with the issue that their parents brought them here. So. And uh, still, the city council is in the part like uh, the public um, comments. Uh -huh. So a lot of speakers are talking about the different um, impacts that is having this rent increases are having in the community. And strategically, we think uh, the teachers are really have been impacted very tremendously. And they are for our community. So they are speaking about that. The students already spoke. So, and uh, we have more, more for that. And um, what are you asking of uh, the, the city council tonight? What are you asking them to do? Just very long, simply. So we are asking for moratorium. So, and then we can. So I, I'm afraid your, um, your audio went out just briefly there. You're asking for a, a moratorium on rent increases. Yes, just yes moratorium. Immediate, an immediate stop. Uh, it can start up again somewhere, but stop, stop the raises, uh, rental increases, and let's talk about it without it outside of the the panic mode, sort of, so to speak. Exactly, exactly. So this is a, one decision that is impacting tremendously our community, and is why the moratorium is very useful and highly needed in order to provide time for take a very, very wise decision. It's not like a, even though it's an emergency, is why we need to wait until we have all the elements to take a decision that is going to be okay with the community. Yeah. Uh, just before uh, you came on, Maria, I was trying to remember what you told me the other day about the percentage of 
uh, people who are renters in Mountain View. Wasn't it somewhere around 60 or 63 percent, you said? Well, yeah, the last answer said uh, 58 percent. So it's very high. A lot of people, we have a population of uh, 75,000 people, so it's a lot of the things being impacted. Okay, well, uh, let me turn back to our guests here in the studio. Stay with us, Maria. We're, you're part sure. of this conversation. It's just going to be a little disjointed for you because you're only going to see me. Uh, no but problem. Daniel Saver and um, Diana Reddy are both here. I, I know you know both of them, so um, we'll just. Yeah, I love you up. guys. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's let's talk about some proposed solutions and where we go about this. Um, First of all, uh, Mountain View Tenants Coalition is asking their city council for a moratorium. Let's just stop rent increases, step back a minute, take a deep breath, and think about what we can do. Is anybody else mm -hmm. doing that yet? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a number of cities that have uh, looked at that option. Um, and what I would say from my perspective is that certainly you know, in these sorts of situations, I would say the best practice would be to proceed by first instituting a moratorium so that, as you said, you can put a pause on the crisis for a moment so that everybody can come to the table, have a rational conversation, and we can devise the right solutions, but we can make that decision uh, in a space that's conducive to making sort of a very difficult decision around you know, a number of different policies that we have to pursue. Right, and a um, lot of different stakeholders. Like, yeah, quite absolutely. Frankly, as, as we started out talking, employers, the workers, the landowners. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and that's a conversation that's going to take a while, and it's useful to have a pause so that everybody can come to the table calmly without fear of losing their home. It's, mm -hmm. it's particularly important so that renters can be a part of that conversation. A lot of renters won't come to the table because they're afraid that something may happen, mm -hmm. that if they speak out, their landlords are going to come after them, uh, which is a very real threat when you don't have any protections as a tenant. Um, so this just creates, like I said, the, the conditions that are necessary for people to participate effectively uh, and that we can make the right long-term decision. Um, there are some other cities that evaluated this option. Um, the, it's not been successful uh, recently in a number of other cities, and the major challenge is that for these sorts of what are called urgency or emergency ordinances, uh -huh. you oftentimes need a supermajority in order to pass it. So depending on what city you're in, uh, there may be different metrics. Um, in many cities, it's four-fifths majority. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what it is in Mountain View, but it means you know you got to get an extra set of votes yeah. to, to actually pass one of these. Let me turn back to Maria. Did you, were you able to hear what Daniel just said? Do you need a yes. sup, uh, do you need a supermajority of the Mountain View City Council to agree to your moratorium plan or a simple majority? Yes, as far as I know, uh, this needs to be supermajority. That will be six. Six, six out votes. of uh, seven. Six out of seven. Mm -hmm. So a near unanimous vote. You've been meeting with city council people uh, individually. Do you think you're going to be able to get to that? That higher number? Well, uh, we are planning to continue this conversation, but so far, honestly, uh, I don't think so. We have the willingness just to support a measure that uh, that we really uh, is badly needed. We are working towards too. From what you said, uh, it reminded me. I, I wanted to go back to some of this context. What are some of the rent increases that, that we're seeing? Uh, people. You know, seeing their rents going up by 10 percent, 20 percent in a year. With I have one tenant who was uh, reporting to me that she gets a $50 increase every month, and another who gets $200 increase every four months, same and thing. others are, are 50, yeah, exactly. it is the same thing. Um, $500 increases, a thousand dollar. We had a, a teacher in San Mateo who reported a thousand dollar increase. And I was going to mention when you're we talking about context that two years ago, uh, teachers were reporting to us that they had so many families that were leaving the area and they were concerned about the children that were leaving the area. This year, one of our schools lost four teachers. Because mm -hmm. they couldn't afford the rent. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So our young teachers are renters too. Well, lots of our teachers, whether they're young or not, they're renters. 
And so um, they're leaving too. And so we are we are creating a real um, a really serious situation. And we often hear, and I know this is one of the the things that uh, Maria and her uh, compatriots in Mountain View are struggling with, what's called unjust evictions. Um, you're the housing attorney. Let me turn to you for a, a quick definition of that and how big a problem is that? Yeah, I mean, I think the critical thing to keep in mind when we're talking about evictions is that uh, oftentimes what we believe is just or right does not coincide with what the law is. So in most jurisdictions in the state of California, landlords are allowed to evict tenants for any reason or no reason at all, as long as it's not an illegal reason, and there's really two of those, which is discrimination and retaliation, both of which are very difficult to prove. Uh, but under normal circumstances, landlords can terminate a tenancy on either 30 days notice or 60 days notice without even telling you why. Really? They're not legally required to even give a reason for why they're evicting you. Uh, can, a, can a local municipality override the state on that, like they can with, say, minimum wage? Yeah, certainly. Absolutely. Yeah, and the policy solution to this is called just cause for eviction. Uh -huh. So it takes the, the current legal framework and flips it on its head a little bit. So instead you have of, to have a reason. Exactly. And it's yeah. got to be a good reason. And, you know, and as a community, we're going to sit down and decide what are the good reasons. And we're going to say you're only allowed to be evicted for one of these reasons, not some arbitrary reason that you're not even obligated to tell us. Has anyone in our general area, any cities done that? Yeah, certainly. There's a number of cities all across the Bay Area that have done it. Um, you know, San Francisco has one of these ordinances, Oakland, Berkeley, uh, East Palo Alto. Um, most recently, Richmond passed the Just Cause for Eviction ordinance that was paired with rent stabilization, uh, though currently that's on pause uh, because the real estate lobby was able to gather enough signatures to overturn the city council's decision. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a time-tested policy. It's been upheld by the California Supreme Court now multiple times. Um, there's really no question that municipalities can do this if they want to. The it's only a question, question of is political why will. haven't they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, really? <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. It's about political will, you know, yeah. and I think as you mentioned that, look, the, the real estate lobby is very powerful generally and it's incredibly powerful in this area. Um, and, uh, you know, landlords and their allies really see this as as a, an attack on kind of their fundamental set of property rights. Um, and so they defend those rights as they conceive of them vigorously. Yeah, I, I know some property owners uh, probably think that blatant discrimination is their property right, but, uh, which yeah, I imagine you, you <laughs> deal a lot with as, as a housing attorney. Yeah, I mean, the main problem now is just that you, Landlords literally don't have to tell you why. I mean, one trend that we're seeing now in this area are um, because the market is so hot, uh, lots of buildings are being sold to essentially speculators uh -huh. who are buying these buildings knowing that they're going to be able to jack the rents up through the roof. Uh, and what they do is they buy a building and then they evict everyone all at once or they do so in waves. And just so, start over, basically, yeah, with, yeah, with higher rents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in Redwood City, you know, we've been working together with Diana on one building, 85-unit apartment complex that was just sold. And within two weeks of closing that sale, they started issuing eviction notices, and they've told everyone that they're going to be evicted. 85 families. 85 families. All at once. And in this housing um, situation, mm -hmm. this housing climate. Mm -hmm. Maria, have you uh, had any experience with your folks there uh, that you're working with in Mountain View of either unjust evictions or uh, landlord retaliation? Are, are any of the speakers that, who are coming, coming up before City Hall concerned about retaliation for speaking out? Yes, unfortunately, Paul, many. Um, is, we really deal with this issue every single day. Um, and it's something that makes no sense, really, because um, when I was listening to Daniel, it came to my mind uh, one thing like that, how the city are able to provide protections for that tree, a heritage tree, that when the landlord wants to remove the tree, they need to follow a process, and they need to pay a fee, and they need to explain why they need to remove it, and then the expert arborist needs to go to check and see if really this tree is going to be able to be removed, then all this process is just a tree. So, but then if we don't have any protections for a tenant when they want just to be evicted without any reason. 
So just make no sense. The argument like we are in the free market is just like a false argument, just this, because every single industry has regulations. The only thing is the regulation about tenants and landlords only works for the other side. It's totally against tenants. And I believe it's totally unfair. And it's why I'm so hopeful that uh, working the way that we are doing it, we are going to be successful in order to, ch to change this status quo. Because I know the, the, the developers have the power, economic power, but we have the power of the people. And yeah. when we speak up, uh, we have power of the people. Then it's a, a very important piece of the equation. Like uh, the workers, is, they are bad needed in this community. Uh, we are going to have a uh, small business owner who is, has been very impacted about the lack of workers. He is not able to hire workers because they, they move. So then what is the market here? So in the long term, this is not going to be beneficial for anybody. But the only thing be the people who has the money the other parts of the world because here it's not working well for anybody. Okay, thank you. Uh, next time we have you on, Maria, see if you can get in a little bit closer to the computer, and I'll ask my audio person in the uh, control room that when Maria is on, if you could crank up the studio speaker a little bit. We're having a little trouble hearing her in here, and let's see if we can can get it um, get it balanced out a, a little bit more. The thing is, we have parties here in the back. As well. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's actually kind of fun to have the background noise yeah. there. It, it adds to the excitement of being live from City Hall. <laughs> yeah. One obvious question that goes on here is that uh, every city is supposed to have a certain amount of below market rate housing, supposedly affordable housing. Um, here in Palo Alto, there's just been an epic struggle over the last couple of years about saving 400 uh, or 120 uh, affordable housing units at the Buena Vista Mobile Home Park. Where is the affordable housing that we're supposed to have, and, and why isn't it there? I, I know what the answer, the first answer is it isn't there, but why isn't it there? <laughs> It happens that, um, I, I'm not sure, again, about Santa Clara County's numbers, but, but there is such a thing as deed-restricted affordable housing, which means that even when the market fluctuates, that, that that housing is guaranteed to be a certain, that people are expected to only pay 30% of their incomes for, for housing. And so this housing is guaranteed to, it, um, people are able to rent because of their income, and and it's guaranteed not to increase in, you know, by more than one or two percent, whatever it is, um, you know, for their income. But um, San Mateo County, for one, has the lowest percentage of deed restricted housing in the entire Bay Area. And I don't think Santa Clara is very much higher. It's, it's, um, ours is like two percent. I mean, it's, it's just embarrassing. And um, so it's, it, again, political will. Yeah. And, um, it's just, um, and so many of the resources that we had for building uh, affordable housing, like uh, redevelopment agencies and those kinds of funds, that, that was a billion dollars a year that was lost uh, a couple of years ago. And so we need to replace that. We need to replace those, that money and uh, so that our city officials can start building affordable, truly affordable housing again. And I see these as being kind of, just to jump in a little on that point, mm -hmm. you know, there's, I think it's, it's useful to make clear that there's two complementary strategies for dealing with the housing crisis. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly complex crisis that has a lot of different causes mm -hmm. and ways in which it's manifesting. And we need a similarly complex, holistic set of approaches. There's no silver bullet that's going to solve this thing. There's no one policy that's magical and is going to somehow just, you know, with the flick of a wand, fix all of this for us. Uh, and well, I, until the revolution comes. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then you have to rebuild afterwards. Uh, you know, so uh, I, I tend to think of the solution. But we'll keep the rent down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you can redesign from the beginning. I mean, I think here, you know, I see the solutions as falling within two buckets. You know, there's a production side mm -hmm. set of solutions that we need to pursue, mm -hmm. right? So we do have a supply and demand imbalance. As Diana mentioned, we're creating way more jobs than we are housing that's going to create escalating 
prices. Uh, you know, that is economics 101. No one's denying that reality. Yeah. Uh, so we need to find ways of producing more housing, and we particularly need to find ways of producing more affordable housing because the market's not just going to make that on its own. Right now, if any developer wants to come in and build housing, they're going to build housing that makes the most money, and that's not affordable housing. You know, right. That's luxury housing for folks that make you know, six figures and more. Uh, a lot more in yeah, this the, area, frankly. You know, you're talking like seven figures here. Yeah, uh, the, the developer that was initially going to buy Buena Vista Mobile Home Park had a brochure out describing that they were going to be building upscale housing yeah. for young tech workers. Yeah, yeah. In, nice. Including the dog grooming area and, and the gym and stuff. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, that makes it clear, right, that you need some type of government policies to uh, help incentivize or, or regulate uh, the outcomes that we need because the market if left on its own just simply won't produce the housing. Yeah. That's a whole set of, of solutions that we need to be going after vigorously to deal with this imbalance that Diana was describing. At the same time, we need to recognize that it's gonna take so long for us to build the amount of housing that we need to hit market equilibrium that by the time we, I mean, that's gonna take what, 10, 20, 30 years that we've got a housing debt that has accumulated over decades. Yeah. It's going to take a long time to get us there. What do you do for the people who are struggling now? Yeah. And so there's a second set of solutions that I like to put in a bucket of kind of community stabilization policies. Um, and these are policies that are designed to actually help uh, keep people in their homes who are here now. It's about preserving the communities that we've got. Uh, and the people who are a part of those communities and make those communities great while we work on these long-term solutions. And so in that bucket, I think you have things like rent stabilization, just cause for eviction, et cetera. And those are really designed towards uh, helping folks stay in their home until we can you know, hopefully build our way out of this decades from now. So did you have something else? Just, in, uh, just for your information, again, statistics, um, it will require 67,000 units of housing in Santa Clara County for low and uh, extremely low income families. So that's just at the low end of the spectrum. Yeah. That's not even including so, market rate housing. So that, that's basically our current housing deficit is 67,000 units. For low income families. For low income families. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one of the people that was suggested to me as a guest tonight, and he couldn't make it, and I'm drawing a blank on his name right now, but he was housing director in Berkeley, I think it was. Sent Steve me a, Barton. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. sent me a, a paper that he recently wrote or submitted some uh, suggesting kind of a windfall profits tax mm -hmm. on these increasing uh, rents to go to subsidize affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Is anybody doing that? It sounded like a great idea to me. <laughs> it is very attractive. <laughs> yeah. But one of the things, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but we really probably should spend a little bit of time explaining what rent stabilization is that, and it isn't. It might be of interest th to your That was your my viewers. next question, yeah. actually, was to get a little wonky. Most people think rent control. We need rent control. But actually, rent control and rent stabilization are different things, right? So I should probably let Daniel answer it. In California, they act, they happen to be the same thing okay. because we don't have rent control in California. I, I, it just depends on what you mean by those terms. Yeah. You know, so I think a lot of um, a lot of folks when they hear rent control, they think price control. It means telling landlords how much money they can charge for an apartment, uh, and that is not allowed in the state of California. It's really not something that very many people are doing at all anywhere in the country. There were price controls that were rigid price controls after World War II when we had really serious issues with our economy and infrastructure, et cetera. And uh, that's kind of what I would call rent control 1.0. Uh, since then, and as particularly in the state of California, any rent stabilization law that we have is a much more moderate kind of compromise uh, set of policies um, by virtue of the state laws that the local cities can't actually change. So what rent stabilization is at its heart is it uh, regulates the amount of rent increases for uh -huh. existing tenants. Um, and as a matter of state law, we have this thing called vacancy decontrol, which means anytime you leave your apartment and a new tenant comes in, the landlord is able to charge market rate rents at the beginning. So uh, the rent, rent comes under a annual percentage cap. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And so the idea here is that you just create the same sort of predictability and stability for renters 
that homeowners have. I mean, you're a homeowner and you buy your home, you have Prop 13 that's protecting you against massive increases in your property taxes. It's essentially rent control for homeowners. Uh -huh. And you oftentimes have fixed term mortgages. So you kind of know how much your costs are going to go up for housing over a period of time. Renters in the current state of affairs don't have those same protections. And rent stabilization just gets you that. Uh, it seems to me we would need this uh, just eviction law in the books first because if they see this is coming, they're going to start kicking everybody in. Usually they come together. Yeah, yeah. And, and the idea is, you know, you do create, given vacancy decontrol, so given the fact that under the law you can raise rents to market if a tenant vacates and then you have a new person come in, that creates a perverse incentive for landlords to boot people out as fast as they can. Yeah. So just cause for eviction comes and fills that gap. And you essentially say, look, you can't evict people just because you want to jack the rents up. You can evict them if they don't pay their rent, or you can evict them if they're creating a nuisance, uh, or if you as the owner want to move in. But you can't just evict people arbitrarily or to take advantage of them economically because of the way the market's working out. Yeah. So they're, very, they're, they're really complementary policies. In, in the best of cases, they and should they come really together. They really should come yeah. together. Uh, let me turn back to Maria Marroquin over at uh, Mountain View City Hall. Uh, Maria, let me just make sure, did you catch most of that conversation? I know we had a little break in our connection there. Um, yes, I get it. And I thank you so much. It was really enlightening. And uh, it's good to have people like them just uh, sharing their knowledge with all your audience. And they have really fixed up your audio. We can hear you really well now. <laughs> Do you, uh, has, has, I don't know if you have any sense of what's going on in the city council meeting. I imagine it's uh, the Mountain View Tenants Coalition, people still uh, speaking to uh, city council. Do you have any idea what the actual city council proposal is going to be tonight? I, I suspect it's going to be um, something like a voluntary mediation project or, or something. Yes, uh, Mike Kaspersak uh, is proposing some voluntary uh, Fair practices, fair rental practices program, and it's something that is going to be uh, talking about later, and then almost at the end of the meeting. Um, and now we are asking very strongly about moratorium, and I have a good feeling about that. I have some uh, comments with uh, some part of the council people, and I believe we are going to be very successful. And just keep in mind, this is just kind of the part of the first round. So this is going to be very, very long uh, fight, uh -huh. struggle, but it, very successful and rewarding. Yeah, you have that reputation, Maria. <laughs> 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 well deserved. Well, long so time in the in the in the struggle. Well, I I assume you're not going to be satisfied with a uh, voluntary plan on the the part of the property owners in in Mountain View. Do you? How have... would you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, th does the uh, Mountain View Tenants Coalition, uh, have you settled together on, on what you're going to be looking for? What's your ideal uh, package to resolve this problem? Well, as I have been saying, it's going to be moratorium now. And then, of course, we need to include the uh, just cause eviction. We need to include the rent stabilization. And why not? We can include also rent control because we shouldn't be afraid. It's something that is really needed for the community. And uh, we already are ready for the next meeting on the 13th. And then this, we are going to have a special study session on the 19th that uh, we are going to be presenting there. We, of course, expect a lot of opposition with really well-articulated and resourceful uh, people who is going to present. And we are going to be there just speaking the truth and fighting for our families and fighting for a very fair community that everybody deserves to be included. Absolutely. Uh, let me just ask uh, Daniel and Diana, do you have any comments you want to share with Maria or questions for her about? Well, just to say, Maria, this is Diana. I wanted to yeah. let you know that Mountain View has um, really inspired us in Redwood City, and we now have uh, weekly marches. Uh, no, not weekly rallies. We did March last week, but we have weekly rallies, and uh, we've had 100 to 200 people at our rallies. 
and um, and you started it in Mountain View. They start a lot well, of things there. Likewise, in Mountain View. <laughs> likewise, we have been long way this struggle through peninsula interfaith action, through our social justice uh, cause, just our work. So you are an inspiration, and you are my hero. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maria. All right, let's let's uh, let's get our audience into the conversation here. We always like to do that on Other Voices. You're part of the uh, solution. Otherwise, you might be part of the problem. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> I just need you to raise your hand, wait for Crystal to arrive with the microphone so that people who are going to see this on tape, and if you could stand up for our cameras, and uh, you can ask Maria or Daniel or Diana, or me, but I won't have the answer because I don't know. I'm not an expert on this thing. Hi, I'm Lynn Heidi Cooper. Yeah. And um, I work with the homeless. And uh, there are 7,000 homeless in Santa Clara County, the fourth largest in the United States. I just heard about a story from a friend of mine who works with the homeless in San Mateo County of a family, a mother and four children, who are now homeless. And they are being shuttled from motel to motel. Um, they're having a hard time getting like two nights in a motel. They just recently went to a day's inn where they were put in a roast, a roach infested uh, um, room that had no electricity, no air conditioning that was illegal for them to put them in. As because the rents are so high, we are seeing more and more people becoming homeless and families. And because she has four children, she's having a hard time getting housing. They discriminate if you have more than two or three kids. So this is a real problem, and people are suffering. What can you comment on that? Thank you. Um. So uh, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that is a huge problem. And what, um, what we've seen is that when families are forced out of their home, either because of an eviction or a rent increase that they just can't afford to pay, because the housing market is so tight and because housing costs are so high, there's simply nowhere for them to go. And uh, what we found is that for a lot of people, they, they grew up here or they've lived here for a long time. They love it in this area and they want to stay. And so they do everything they can to try and find a way to make it work. We hear a lot of stories about people moving over to the East Bay or to the Central Valley and that is happening. Um, but a lot of folks, because of the, the good things we've got going for us here, they try and make it stay. Uh, my, my office works with um, every unrepresented tenant who goes through a judicial eviction proceeding in the county of San Mateo and makes it kind of all the way to the end of that process. And we conducted a survey of the folks that we worked with um, as part of this program, most of whom had to move out of their homes because of the way the law is structured, as we talked about before. And uh, we were trying to figure out, you know, where are people going? What's happening? And the results of this preliminary survey were, were shocking, quite frankly. We found that about 50% of people had been homeless at some point after their eviction. And we found that about 50% of the people who we spoke with at the time we spoke with them were either homeless or living with friends, family, on couches, essentially in unstable housing. But they were homeless or they were in unstable housing here. They hadn't left yet. And it's because they didn't want to take their kids out of the schools. It's because they didn't want to leave their churches. It's because they didn't want to have to leave their families, their friends, their community. And so they try and make it work. Uh, but that is really difficult for those families. And it's also, you know, just I think from a cost benefit kind of public administration perspective, that's where there's a lot of services that have to be provided for these folks. It would make a lot more sense to keep people in their homes to begin with rather than force them out and then have to try and handle the difficult situations that arise thereafter. Then, um public tax dollars go into supporting them instead of their right. supporting themselves yeah. with jobs and, and paying mm -hmm. their rent. Let me just uh, check in with Maria. Uh, are, is, are you okay on time? I, I know you're really busy over there at City Hall. Uh, can you stick with us for another 10, 15 minutes? 
Well, I rather just go back to my group because the public comments are already over. Okay. And notice like they wasn't willing just to put move the other item to the agenda. So it looks like we are going to stay long. Okay. Uh, night, and I need to check out at that. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I really appreciate the opportunity, and I feel like a um, Hollywood star now. <laughs> like uh, you are Skyping from here. So yeah. thank you so much to my dear Mary and the wonderful group that you have, and I hope to have you here soon. Okay, thanks for joining us, Maria Maro King with uh, Mountain View Tenants Coalition. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. And uh, Bye -bye. we'll see you soon. And uh, special thanks to our board member, Mary Klein, uh, who was doing the Skype work on the other end for us out there at, at Mountain View City Hall. So we've got about 15 minutes left. Any more questions out here or comments? Uh, we got lots. So Crystal, right back there. And if you would stand up. Sure. Hi there. Um, my name's Kendra. I am a uh, Bay Area local. I grew up here in Palo Alto uh, and now live in Santa Clara. I am a um, one of the young families of moderate income. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I work at a small research center. My husband works in a nonprofit. Um, my interestingly, my mom, who raised me in this area, is now a land a landlord. So we're in this interesting position of um, <laughs> <laughs> well. Anyways, all the complexities of the housing situation. Thank you. All the complexities of the housing situ situation are very personal um, as well as political here. So I'm wondering, I have two questions. One is we've talked a lot about affordable housing, and maybe I missed this at the beginning, but how are we defining affordable housing? Could you say a little bit more? Um, and you know, I do research in social policy, and one of the challenges is that I find is federal definitions of affordability are completely out of whack with the reality of federal about of the cost of living in this area. So how does that play out in the definition of affordable housing. And the other is, um, have you folks seen other alternatives, in addition to public policy, have you seen other alternatives emerging in this area? You know, any sort of co-housing, um, any more emergence? I'm thinking specifically about um, long-term urban movements for affordable and cooperative housing. And do we see any sort of, um, any of that emerging in, in the Bay Area? Uh, it seems one possibility for, for some of the demographic that needs to be served by housing. Excellent questions. So the there, um, so affordable housing is actually a, le a legal term. And there are four levels of affordable housing. Um, the, the numbers that I'm familiar with in uh, San Mateo County, um, is moderate, that's the highest. That's a single person who makes 85.6 and a family of four that's about 110,000. Mm -hmm. And then 50,000 and then 25,000 and then less. So those are in San Mateo County, those are the levels of affordability. But as, um, as I was indicating, anywhere else in the country, if you were making $50,000, you're doing pretty well and you're able to um, keep your family in your home, but not here. You can't do that here. Let me try to understand what you're just saying. Those are income levels that they would qualify for? For affordable, affordable, housing, for affordable for the, housing. For the deed restricted housing that I was referring to before. So yeah. someone making 85,000, did you say? 86,500 would, would qualify. So this is one of the issues that, that many times market rate developers will include um, five units, 10 units of below market housing. It's generally at that upper level. And so it's not affordable for most of our people, and certainly not affordable, you know, for low-income people. And some of my own, um, my personal friends and I get into discussions about the small houses. You know, that that's a great, uh, perhaps, option for um, homeless single people, but not our family of four. You know, with four kids. And so it it's it is a hugely complex issue. And um, any time we're talking about uh, volunteer, you know, voluntarily asking landlords to do certain things that just has not been successful. Go ahead. Yeah, just a, a, a comment a little bit on kind of the way that sometimes the federal definitions mismatch with the mm -hmm. local reality. In in this instance with affordable housing, the, the federal guidelines are actually geared towards uh, what's called area median income. Right. And so it's actually locally adjusted. And so mm -hmm. in areas like this where you actually have 
relatively high incomes compared to other parts of the country. You can be some a single person making 85.6 and still qualify for, you know, uh, government subsidized housing, um, which is which is actually a good thing because it it does map a little bit better onto the reality given how high housing costs are here. Yeah. Um, so that is something that we I think can be can be thankful for that it's not as much matched as it may be in some other instances. Uh, to, to your second question, like Dana said, I think that there are some kind of creative ideas. Um, the and some of them are, I think, like you mentioned, you know, co co-housing is a good one. Uh, you know, small units, tiny houses is another one for a certain segment of the population. I, Give I honestly us a quick think that, definition of co-housing. Well, there's like a lot of different ways that it would look. Um, so, you know, some of the stuff that I'm more familiar with, I actually lived in a co-housing situation for a while in San yeah. Francisco, which was a kind of a converted commercial space um, where we adapted it to have multiple different um, kind of family units living together with a shared kitchen and other shared facilities. Okay. So it was a lot, I mean, you have roommates uh, and you do share some of the kind of critical functions, but it keeps costs low. You know, and for some people, you know, they actually appreciate the community that you get in uh -huh. that. I'm one of those folks. Uh, and yeah. other folks, it's really just about the price point. You know, you can bring prices down when you're able to do that sort of thing. Um, and tiny houses, I feel like I've had a bunch of different definitions. Depends on how you want to define them, how tiny, et cetera. Uh, it, these I, are the things you see on Facebook all the time. Right. Right? Salt Lake City yeah. or somewhere, someplace yeah. in Utah put up all these little yeah. tiny yeah. houses. It, it's great to have those, you know, I think like near transit for young single people who are going to work at the tech companies, you know, for example. Like that may be a good option where you're not necessarily spending a whole lot of time in your apartment anyways because you're working or hanging out. Uh, you want to be out in a kind of an urban setting and home is really just where you come home to sleep. And that's a, a good option for folks that want to kind of pursue that type of lifestyle. But not a good option for kids it's doing homework at the kitchen table. Really, really not a good option yeah. for them. Yeah. Um, another thing that is getting a lot of play recently are second units or accessory yeah. dwelling units. Um, so, you know, this may be your in-law unit that you would construct kind of in the backyard or, you know, uh, converting other types of what traditionally wouldn't be livable spaces, you know, in a, in a home. Uh, that's a, another way that's, you know, not without its controversy, uh, but it's another way of increasing housing stock without really adding a lot of height and density, which is often attractive to, I think, this general area where, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of folks came here because they don't want to be in a really urban environment. Yeah. Um, that's one, it's another option, you know, and yeah. I think that the critical thing is no one of these is going to do it. You know, we're going to need uh, a bunch of them all together, I think, in order to really make a dent in the deficit of housing that we've got ourselves in. Yeah, I think one of the things where I am coming to understand from doing this program, I really appreciate all the information you've both shared, is how complex these uh, resolutions are going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, with the, wh Where we're starting uh, to try mm -hmm. to resolve this and who's holding all the cards, et cetera, uh, it's a tough one. Any other quick al ideas for alternative housing? Uh, or I'll go back to the audience for some more questions here. We've still got a lot of hands out there. No. no. Okay. Um, there we go. Right here. Keep it close. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my name is Mike Hitchcock, and I noticed in reading, you know, in the media how this issue is covered. Keep it up. It's usually presented as rent stabilization versus the free market. And as most of us know, housing doesn't exist in a free market. It's a market where government controls the supply. And we have at the federal level, you know, policies that work to increase the value of property through the Federal Reserve money supply and all of that. Um, but I don't, I've actually written to a couple of reporters about this. They don't seem to get that concept that this is a market that is already regulated. And to a great extent, what we have is that we don't have limits on how high rents can grow, go, but we have limits on how low rents can go. Um, is there any way of working with the media to get them to maybe understand that a little better? I mean, I think the, so I, I appreciate the point of it. And kind of where I, I think you're absolutely right to say that the current housing market is not an unregulated market at all. Um, and, I, and I typically think of this in the context of, you know, this argument that somehow, you know, certain property rights are sacrosanct 
and we're just not supposed to touch how much a landlord can charge for rent, and, which I think is just not consistent with the existing reality. So I think a, a common example for this, that, and maybe this is one way of trying to work with, with the media to convey the idea in terms that folks will understand, is zoning laws. Zoning laws are restrictions on private property rights. The city tells you in great detail what you can and cannot do with your property based on zoning. And that has an impact on the bottom line of how much you can get out of your property. If you have something that's zoned for a single family home, it will have a certain value. If you then zoned it for a 20 story skyscraper, the value is going to go through the roof. By not allowing people to build whatever it is that they want on their property, we have regulated their property. We have absolutely limited the profit potential of their property. Rent stabilization is just another common sense way of doing that in order to protect vulnerable people. It's not crazy. It's really not that radical. It's not like this is the first time we are entering into regulating land use and property rights. That's a hallmark of the American legal system. I mean, that's what it's like to live in a democracy is that we all have a lot of freedoms and we impose certain limitations on our own freedoms in order to live together well. That's just the way that law works in a place like this. Uh, so I, I really don't put a lot of credence into this argument that you know, the housing market's unregulated or that for some reason it needs to be completely unregulated. I think you're right and that's a challenge for, for advocates and for, for supporters to try and say, look, that's just not, that's a bogus argument. Right. Just to add one, one small idea that I have, um, in terms of the um, are already letting people know how they can use their property. I can conceive that in those areas where there is a huge flooding problem that um, city councils uh, might say that you need to um, elevate your home in order to keep it safe. I can, I can conceive that they might want to do that. Or in an area where there are huge fires, fire potential that a city council might say that you need to keep the brush away from your home within 50 feet or 100 feet or whatever yeah. that, that potential is. We're on fire right now. Our community is on fire. And so we need brave city council members to stand up and say, I recognize that our community is on fire and I need to do something about it. And they need their constituents there telling them that if you take those steps, we'll keep you in. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, it's happening in Mountain View. It's yes, happening yes. in Redwood City. Uh -huh. um, it happened in East Palo Alto. That's, that's uh, I think, why they have rent stabilization over there, because of some pretty critical situations a few years ago with a lot of people having their rents jacked up. And yeah, and East Palo Alto really is kind of a, an outlier based on local politics here. I mean, the, the council there is uh, very, I think, receptive to the difficulties that renters face. Um, and you have there a, a community that historically has been a, a, a place for low-income people of color. And, you know, lo and behold, they make public policy decisions that actually Reflect. favor, you know, low-income <laughs> people of color, yeah. you know, which is, we find shocking, but it's like, well, that's just how responsive politics work, you know. Uh, <laughs> So uh, that's what it's supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and so I think, you know, East Palo Alto is actually, uh, you know, I think a lot of cities around here don't want ever to be held up compared to East Palo Alto. But I actually think if you just look at it on the policy level, there's a lot of great things that have been implemented in East Palo Alto that have been critical to slow the tide of displacement. I mean, East Palo Alto is still facing gentrification pressures. Um, but if we didn't have rent stabilization, if we didn't have Just Cause, I mean, it would look like Palo Alto. It would have looked like that five years ago. Yeah, you know, uh, that's a major part of why that city still retains some of its character and some of its culture uh, and a lot of the great progressive values that have made it what it is because yeah. they've kept those people there. I wish we could end on that positive note, but we have four or five minutes to go. So <laughs> back to the audience. Okay, we have three minutes to go, uh, so maybe one more here. If you will stand up. Uh, yeah. I have a fairly simple question. What do you, what do you see the long-term consequences are if nothing is done? So wh wh where is this gonna take us if, if no action is taken? That sounds like a good last question. We already have business owners who themselves are renters who are needing to close their businesses because they, they can't attract, they can't hire and retain employees and they can't um, afford to pay the rising uh, rents for their 
for their businesses even. So it's not just residential, but it's also business rents that are going up. And so what I envision, if nothing is done, in, Red, in my Redwood City is that we're going to have these um, huge, you know, sky, not skyscrapers, but they're, they're going to be multi-storied buildings and there's going to be, um, you know, high-tech businesses and will not be small businesses at all. And it's um, people who, um, the restaurants, I'm not sure how the restaurants are going to attract people to, 40% of the people that, that reside at our uh, Maple Street shelter, actually people who work at Safeway and Applebee's and Kmart as it is. So maybe all we need to do is just create more shelters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have, we'll have high, um, high income people uh, working in Redwood City, and then we'll just have to add more shelters. That, that'll take care of it. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a real plan, does it? Yeah. You want to take a shot at that? Yeah, question? I mean, I, I, it's, I, it's an interesting question. Yeah, and I think it, it, that that's a that brings us to the other end of the spectrum from that optimistic view of East Palo Alto. I mean, it's a I think it's very depressing, and I, I think what to me is it's going to be monochrome. It'll be monocultural. It'll be like a gated community. You know, the, mm -hmm. the entire peninsula and Silicon Valley will be like one enormous gated community. Uh, and uh, what I but just, who does the work? <laughs> yeah, and, and you're, we're gonna. I mean. Uh, it's, I think we're already seeing it. What, what's most troubling to me about that question is that I don't think we're talking about 10 years from now. Yeah. I don't even know if we're talking about five years from now. Mm -hmm. I think we're talking about a couple of years from now, this place is, it just doesn't look the same. Uh, you don't have the cultural vibrancy. You don't have the same uh, you know, level of services that we enjoy. You don't have people working in those restaurants that we all like to eat at. I mean, I think that it really changes quickly I think that that puts an exclamation mark on the need to act uh, swiftly to deal with these problems. I don't think it's too late. I do think that we could, with thoughtful, decisive interventions, change that future, but we've got to act quick. I'm going to have to end it right there. That's a fine uh, ending note, too. Daniel Saver, housing attorney with the Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto, and Diana Reddy with Redwood City Residents for Renter Protection. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us here. You've been watching Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. See you next month. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect program. Terrific.